Welcome to one video of two where I'm going to talk to you about using Google Forms for recording SLO data. The reason I have this as two videos is because um, I want to break it into two pieces. One is discussing the best way to set up a Google Form and then the second video which I think is the more meaty video is using the spreadsheet pivot table to get the data to come to you really easily. So um, I'm going to kind of rapid fire through Google Forms just to give you some tips, um, if you have any questions at all, reach out to me and uh, I can help you navigate. But I will, at the end of this video and in the comment section, send you a copy of a form that you can edit yourself. So I will send you this form and then I've indicated here to make a copy, you would hit those three dots and you can save it into your own drive and then edit it how you want. Um, but I just wanted to give some tips for Google Forms. What's nice about Google Forms is that it's really user friendly. It's a lot like working in Word. You can't format text very well, so you can't have bold font. And um, you notice I have a, a link here and I can't even hyperlink. But for the most part, it's pretty easy to navigate. The, the tools are pretty straightforward. So I just wanted to discuss with you some of the options for the way I've designed questions, kind of a trial and error basis. Um, so just so that you know why the questions look the way they do. And maybe you might wanna edit it for your own purposes. So the first thing I wanna point out is I used um, my own work Gmail account that I created. It's kdam.saddleback at gmail.com. I didn't use my work, uh, we have access to G Suite. I didn't use G Suite for two reasons. One is I started this before we had G Suite access so um, it didn't work out because I had to make something myself. I, um, if you want to use G Suite, you can. I have had a faculty member give me some feedback that um, when you launch this Google Forum in G Suite, it has a new question that um, I don't get using this Gmail account that asks who, who you want the form to be available to. And when she selected just um, our institution folks from our institution, which sounds reasonable because only folks from our institution really should be filling this form out, it actually limited who could fill it out in terms of administrative staff and they couldn't edit it or fill it out. So something to consider, we're still working out the kinks with G Suite. Um, once she said, okay, never mind, open it up to everyone in the world, that problem was remedied, but that means that they couldn't use their G Suite accounts to fill out the form. So something to consider. The second reason why I used a, um, a unique Gmail account is because I didn't want to mix my personal Gmail with my work Gmail. Um, I'd like those files to be separate. It makes it easier if um, I switch positions, somebody else becomes department chair, I can save the files more easily than just saving, you know, sharing um, personal files. It's just something I think is a good idea is to separate work from personal. So anyway, you can decide for yourself whether you want to, how you want to move forward with that. So I just wanted to point out a few things. And again, this is rapid fire. So uh, reach out to me if I go too quickly on something. Um, I have chosen to list all the SLOs that we will record each semester um, on this website. So basically on this website, I up it, update it in the summer and say, hey, this upcoming year we will record the following SLOs and then I email that out to our faculty. Um, some people that I've talked to who created forums have decided to put the SLOs actually in the forum itself saying, hey, we're recording this SLO, what are the data that you got? One thing I caution against putting it in the form is that you have to edit the form then every time you want to record um, new SLOs. Unless you list all of your SLOs and have them select which SLO they recorded, I would suggest that if you do that, then they might make, they might record the wrong SLO. So I like the way I have it where I don't have to edit my form every semester. I actually very rarely edit my form. Um, and that way, all I have to do is update this link. And even if you didn't want to have a website, you could say, see email for current SLO that we're recording and then at the beginning of the year you can email your faculty and say which SLOs are being recorded. So I like the idea of not putting it in the form so that I don't have to keep updating my form. My form kind of just stands as is. So the next or the first question I have for them 
is the semester that they are collecting the data for. Notice this says fall 2019 and it goes to spring 2021. Um, if you wanted to add, let's say it's spring 2021 and now we want to add another one for fall, you would just click somewhere in here um, to start kind of initiating the process. And now watch what happens. I'm just going to start clicking and make maybe fall 2021. And notice that um, Google automatically put it above other. And they realize that other should really be the last option. And so um, it puts it in towards the end. Now, if I'm recording from fall 2021, really I shouldn't be recording anymore from fall 2019. That data should have been done and recorded. I can feel comfortable. Um, actually, I'll just pretend this is the fall 2019. I can feel comfortable just deleting that data uh, or deleting that option. If I delete that option, what's nice is the data are still recorded in the spreadsheet. So nothing gets removed. So if you've ever used older systems, when you change options, if I had changed this to fall 2021, it would mess up all my old fall 2020s would now be changed to fall 2021. But in fact, if you change these options here, it will keep the old selections in the spreadsheet, which means that no data are lost. I like that. So that's something to consider. Notice that I made this required. I want my people, or my people, I want our faculty to tell us which um, semester they're recording for. Now notice that it says fall, spring, fall, spring. Now I want you to remember that you don't have to record every semester. The requirement for our institution is one SLO per course per year. So these could say fall, 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 and I would be totally in compliance. The reason why I also have fall and spring and fall and spring is because some of our classes are only offered in the fall and some of our classes are only offered in the spring. So that may mean that I have to have um, both options for people to indicate which year the, um, I'm sorry, which semester the course was run. And so it's up to you whether you choose to record in the fall or in the spring or both. Some faculty, some departments like to record both semesters so they have lots of data to discuss and that's totally fine. Just so you know, the minimum is one SLO per course per year. All right, I'm just gonna run down and then give some more tips. Here's another required uh, question. Actually, all of my questions are required except for the last one. So I'll, I'll point out why that one's not required. Um, this is a list of courses. And so um, I have all of our courses listed here. If you have a list of courses in a Word document or an Excel file or something like that, if you just click in here somewhere and copy and paste, Google Forms will say, hey, each new line should indicate a new response. So it will actually put in each course as a new selection, um, which is nice. That means you don't have to type in all the courses, if you have a list somewhere already, um, and I'm thinking of kind of English and some of the departments that have lots of courses, that that's a nice option for them is they don't have to type them all in. They can just copy and paste um, and those courses will be selected. Moving right along, my next required course is, uh, or my question is course modality. So I want them to indicate whether it's fully face-to-face, -face, fully online, or hybrid. And that's because we are going to differentiate between those in our reporting of our SLO data. So I wanna make sure that I record from them whether they were face-to-face -face or fully online. And then here's an open response field that indicates ticket number. Now, some departments don't wanna record ticket number because they're afraid that faculty will feel that they are being judged. I wanna record ticket number because then I know what data I'm missing. So if I, if I find that there's certain chunks of courses that I am not getting access to, if I have ticket number, I can reach out to the faculty and say, oh, I don't have your SLO data yet. Um, I really believe that the notion of feeling judged by looking at each particular course individually is can be remedied by um, discussing with your department the purpose of SLOs, how it's not supposed to be about judging you, it's how it's supposed to make the department grow and the sharing of ideas. And so that really does happen in the way you communicate. We wanna collect data so we can figure out what's going well, how we can improve, what resources you need. Um, so make sure that you can communicate that so that people feel welcome um, to report accurate data. 
I totally forgot to say in the video at this point that a faculty member needs to fill out this form for each ticket number. So don't have them sum their multiple classes and fill it in one time. Each ticket number needs to have their own entry. Now I'm just going to click in here so I can show you my options. So I would ask them to type in ticket number and I'll show you some of the responses that we received. This is a short answer. Now I know that our ticket numbers never fall below four care, uh, numbers. So I, I set the length to be um, at least four, sometimes it's more. And that way if they try to give me a number that says like 333, I've then said, uh oh, are you sure you're entering the ticket number? That's just to catch them in case they're making a mistake. Because I do have people type in the wrong ticket number from time to time, and it takes a little bit of sleuthing for me to figure out what they really meant. Um, so this stops them from at least having a number that's too short. So again, it's up to you whether you want to record ticket number. I find it very useful for me to know um, uh, which courses I have and which courses I'm missing. And that's really all that I look at is which courses I have. And then after that, I, I collapse all the data together and I'm looking at courses, like all the Psych 1 courses. I don't look at each ticket number. I'm really just using this to know who I'm missing. And I have really good compliance. I think we have almost 100% compliance from semester to semester. So I, I think it's really useful for me to record this data. Okay, now this question is not um, something that is required for you to do as um, department chair in reporting your SLOs. However, I found it very useful. So I have asked them just what type of assignment they use. Now, some departments will dictate which kind of assignment that um, that faculty are to be using. And our department, we let our faculty decide. We sometimes give them options and suggestions, but we let them decide. And so we have these are the different kinds of questions or types of assignments that might happen in our department. And this all varies from department to department. So for example, if you have a lab assignment, you're not gonna maybe have uh, uh, the same kinds of options here. Um, English might have different options here. Child development uh, might have different options. So this all is dependent on what you record in your department. The reason I like this is because we did find very differing results based on whether they were multiple choice questions or open-ended questions or like writing assignments. And that was important for us because it launched a conversation in our department meeting about why that would be and what we need to do to bridge that gap. And is there something we can learn from that? So that's something to consider. If type of assignment isn't important to you, what is important to you in your department? Maybe there's something in here you should be asking that you think would be helpful to decide what is necessary to build the department to improve. So if, if there's something else that you think would be helpful to learn, oops, um, from each um, faculty member, then add that here. So then this is where the meat comes from. I asked the students, uh, sorry, I asked the faculty to report the total number of students who took the assessment and then the um, total number of students who passed that assessment. Now you'll notice here I said, I am no longer recording those who skipped the entire assessment. This is a special note to my faculty because for a couple years, I was also asking them to tell me how many students skipped the assessment. So maybe the class had 45 students in it and only 40 took the assessment. And I, I found it informative to know, or sorry, I thought it would be informative to know that five skipped the assessment altogether. Our department had talked about it and we decided that skipping the assessment may be indicative of um, not being able to pass it. So for example, if they skip a writing assignment, it may be the assignment was too hard and that's why they skipped it. It wasn't just because they you know, stopped participating in the course. So that's why we had chosen to record that information so that we could again, sink our teeth into it and see if there was anything there. I can tell you for our department that nothing really panned out there, so I stopped asking that question. So that's why I have this special note to my faculty because those who've been working with us for a couple of years might have looked for that. And what was nice is I could just remove that question from this form. The answers still remained in the spreadsheet, but now you can't add to it. So there's no place to add that answer now, um, but I didn't lose the data I had before. So for you, you might just say, tell us the total number of students who took the assessment, and then um, the total number of passed. I also like this language here, there's no wrong answers, all data are useful, so that way that they don't um, feel like they're going to be judged. Now, if you have an assignment that, let's say it's a writing assignment, 
and the entire writing assignment speaks to the SLO. Um, and I can say that the easiest thing to indicate count of pass is multiple choice because you just count up how many students got the right answer. But let's say it's a writing assignment. What we have decided as a department is that if someone scores at least a 70% or above on that assignment, they are considering to be have passed that assignment. So this is something that your department will want to decide and then perhaps indicate it here. So if it's a larger assignment that you're using as a resource for SLO data, um, what is necessary to count as pass? And then I do know um, some other departments have other ideas. Uh, I love that uh, the anthropology department, they have um, a special rubric for their SLOs so that even though the assignment might be a very large assignment, the SLO piece may be a small subset of that assignment. So they have a unique rubric that they use when um, grading that assignment that speaks just to the SLO piece. And so then they would indicate here uh, a count of pass. So discuss with your department what makes most sense and then make sure you articulate it here. Then the last piece, which I think is really one of the best pieces of this, and notice it's not required, but it can be very, very useful. I'm basically just asking the faculty to say, hey, what do you think happened here? What worked? What didn't work? And you can find that faculty will give you some really good feedback. Um, sometimes when I go into the department meeting, we have numbers for SLOs. I don't know really how to launch a conversation about, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? What, what can we do different? Because anytime I've posed those questions, it's kind of skip blank stares back at me like blink, blink. So this has helped me launch conversation. Somebody might say, um, I made uh, the SLO question um, voluntary and I didn't get a very good response. So now I know next time to not do that. So then I shared that with the department and then we had a long discussion about that. Somebody might say, oh, I found my handout was too confusing and I don't think that it worked. I have to work on a new handout. And then when I bring that up in the department meeting, somebody else might say, I have a fabulous handout. Let me share it with you. So I find that the answers that come in this comment section can be used to launch conversation in department meetings. And I can um, kind of uh, record that conversation, not record it on audio, but like I can keep notes of what things we said we needed, what things we said we're gonna change. That is meaty information to share in your annual SLO report that you give to the school. And then if you think you need something, you now have justification for a purchase because you've articulated in a department meeting that new handouts were needed or new models were needed. Um, and you're also demonstrating how the department is taking the data and discussing it and making changes. A lot of our part-time faculty communicated that they don't know if their question was that good. And that's why we decided started to decide to start sharing um, questions across the department that could be used. And so that didn't cost us anything, but it's certainly a way in which we've used the data um, to make changes and offer more help to our part-time faculty who didn't necessarily know if their questions were good or wanted some more guidance. So this concludes the part of the video where I show you about the Google Forms, but I think the real fun comes in when we look at the results, which we will be able to look at here. So check into the next video to see how we can use the results in a really easy, fun way.